Well, good afternoon and welcome along to the programme. I'm Justin Briley, your host for the next hour and a half for Unbelievable. Yes, it's the show that aims to get you thinking in a special um, Christian discussion on the programme today. Uh, not our usual atheist or non-Christian discussion. Uh, we are going to be actually joined by two guests talking about a recent controversial conference in the USA. More on that in just a moment's time. Uh, if you are continuing to listen this afternoon, and I hope you are, then don't forget that the profile interview follows Unbelievable between four and five this afternoon. And our, my special guest today, it's actually a replay of a, an interview I played out earlier in the year, is Rowan Williams, the former Archbishop of Canterbury, talking to me about his 10 years in office, the ups and downs of ministry at the head of the Anglican Church. So uh, do listen out for that between four and five this afternoon. Um, and of course, uh, plenty more to come here on Premier Christian Radio across the rest of the day. Uh, for the moment, I wonder if you heard about the Strange Fire Conference. Let me tell you what this is all about. You're unbelievable. Well, uh, recently, a well-known US Bible teacher, John MacArthur, held the Strange Fire Conference in which he and a number of other speakers condemned effectively the charismatic church as non-Christian and even heretical. It's leading people astray with false doctrine and emotionalism. Well, over half a billion Christians make up the charismatic and Pentecostal church worldwide. It is the fastest growing movement within Christianity. So, does John MacArthur have a point? His sharpest criticisms are very much for those who preach a divinely sanctioned health and wealth message. People like Benny Hinn, for instance, who I wrote an article on recently for Christianity magazine. Now, unfortunately, uh, John MacArthur nor anyone from the Strange Fire Conference were able to take part in today's programme. But I am joined on the show today by Pastor Doug Wilson of Christchurch in uh, Moscow, Idaho. He's a prominent Calvinist writer, blogger and cessationist. Effectively, he agrees with John MacArthur that the operation of the charismatic gifts of the Spirit was for the early church only and ceased with the closure of the canon of Scripture. And on the other side of the discussion today is Adrian Warnock. He's a reformed blogger also. He's a writer, but he's a charismatic. He speaks in tongues, believes in gifts of healing and prophecy for today. So with these two guests, I'm going to be discussing this strange fire conference, the good, the bad and the ugly of the modern charismatic movement and whether the charismatic gifts of the spirit are for today. Of course, I'll be giving out the ways you can find out more about the guests a little bit later on. And I do hope you get in touch too. Uh, you can find contact details, ways to listen back to the programme as ever at the website where you'll find the podcast of today's programme. That's at premier.org.uk slash unbelievable. Well, first of all, a very warm welcome to my two guests who join me today. First of all, Adrian, thank you for joining me in studio today. Thank you. Uh, it's great to be back, Justin. Um, yes, I think we were last coming on to talk about an issue that Doug actually sparked, if my memory serves yes, me right. It, I about, believe it was, yes. About um, complementarianism and so on uh, in the church. Uh, that was uh, well over a year ago now, I think. But um, today um, you're here to talk about this strange fire conference. Um, when did you first get wind of of this uh, conference that John MacArthur put on in, in October? Well, I was vaguely aware of it earlier this year, but I just initially thought I'd just ignore it um, because I know there's plenty of people uh, that would have a different view to me on the gifts of the Holy Spirit, and that in itself doesn't really bother me. Um, but I think what really drew my attention uh, was coming across some publicity for the material that accused charismatics and it was charismatics, not some charismatics, charismatics as a group of blasphemy against the Holy Spirit. Um, and that, I think I heard about that in about September time, August time, something like that. So I was a bit alert to that. And I remember writing something about my blog on it then. And then obviously uh, thought I'd better pay attention and see what they actually said at the conference. We're going to be talking about the conference. It's also a book, um, and we'll obviously make links available to those who want to get hold of the book as well, um, which I think you have had a chance to read as well, yes, haven't I you, have, Adrian? Yeah. And um, very much mirrors what was said at the conference. Yeah. Um, let's introduce our other guest today. He is, as I've mentioned, Doug Wilson of Christchurch in Moscow, Idaho. A very warm welcome onto the show to you, Doug. Thank you for joining me today. Uh, very good to be with you. Thanks for the invite. Uh, you're very welcome. Doug, give us a little background to yourself as someone who we haven't had on the show before now. Um, uh, you, you're, you're a pastor. Uh, you're a writer. Tell us a bit, a bit about your kind of theological position that you take and, and your emphases when it comes to church leadership. I'm a, I'm a conservative Presbyterian pastor. Uh, we have to qualify that because we have a large number of Presbyterians here in the States, who don't believe the Bible, we're the kind of Presbyterians who do. <laughs> um, so I've, 
uh, conservative evangelical reform pastor. Our worship is um, generally uh, traditional uh, liturgical, which is um, not how we started. When, when our church started, it was a Jesus people type fellowship back in the 70s. Mm. Uh, but we've grown, we've grown and um, developed over the years. Uh, so so you, you've kind of gone in the opposite direction that most people kind of t- tend to go in that, that sense. Is, that, is, that is correct. <laughs> so although I'm uh, a traditional, I'm not traditionalist, if that distinction makes uh, uh, sense to you. Mm-hmm. And I'm not talking about things I've never been in. I've, a lot of the stuff I'm uh, I'm dealing with here, we came, we came from. Okay, that's an interesting perspective then to have on this. Um, you've 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 written a little bit. In fact, um, you've kindly wrote um, one half of a mini debate for Christianity Magazine some months ago on the issue of the gift of tongues. So I know where you stand yeah. on this. You're a cessationist, but would you like to just define what what that means for you? Right. Uh, the word cessationist means that you believe that something has ceased, and I think that it's uh, crucial that we define exactly what it is that has ceased, that is no longer operative. Um, my concern, my central concern in all of this, is to recognize that there were there was uh, there were spiritual gifts operative in the in the first century uh, that resulted in the production of scripture the, the resulted in the writing of scripture and i believe that it is crucial for orthodoxy that we put a firewall there uh, such that we don't create theological categories that could allow people to write new books of the bible so that's uh, what is it that is ceased well it's not the holy spirit that is ceased it is not the Holy Spirit's promptings that have ceased. It is not the Holy Spirit's guidance that has ceased. It's not answers to prayer that have ceased. Um, what has ceased is the inspired, revelatory activity of the Holy Spirit. So when when, the Lord. when St. Paul says, um, you know, tongues will cease, um, gifts of knowledge will cease, you believe he was talking about and in a not very distant future, in the sense that once the canon closed, those things did cease. Yes, I, I, I do believe he's talking about that in First Corinthians 13, although I wouldn't base my case for cessation on that passage. Mm. I, I, don't, I don't think that's a strong passage okay. um, for making that case, although I think it's consistent with it. Well, tell us then, Strange, the Strange Fire Conference, um, it must have come across your radar too. Um, what's your overall reaction to this conference that MacArthur has put on? And we will hear a little bit about of him introducing the conference in just a moment. Um, sure. I, I became aware of the conference because it uh, sort of erupted on Twitter and everybody was, uh, you know, I, I, I saw the uh, result of the, the dust up. People were talking about it and so forth. And I've uh, seen a clip from it. I've read. I I, I have read John MacArthur's um, earlier book on um, this whole thing. I, Charismatic, I Charismatic Chaos was that one. Chaos. Yeah. Mm, yeah. Mm. I've, I've I've read that one. So I'm. I was generally up to uh, up to speed on his uh, take. He has very little patience with um, um, the whole with the whole thing. And I saw some of the reactions to it, and so. Uh, didn't go through the conference. You know, I, I didn't uh, watch the videos mm. of the conference or listen to the tapes, but I'm generally situated or oriented on, I, I okay. think I know what's happening there. And um, overall, um, do you welcome it, or do you think it's divisive, unhelpful? I, well, that, that's, a, that's a hard one. I would say, um, I would say that this sort of reaction is, um, is is going to happen. So if you have if you have an enormous movement as you have in the charismatic world, with so much of it uh, unpoliced and needing to be policed, uh, there there will be this sort of um, um, statement made by somebody somehow that makes everybody talk about things that I believe need to be talked about. So in that. In that sense, I think the Strange Fire Conference is helpful. I'm glad it happened. 
which is not the same thing as saying that I agree with okay. everything, <laughs> everything that was said there. All right. Well, let, let's hear a little bit from the conference itself. Um, John MacArthur leads um, uh, Gr- the Grace Community Church out in California. Indeed, we air their programs. Grace to you have a radio ministry here on Premier Christian Radio. But um, certainly, uh, he has certainly put the cat among the pigeons when he organised this latest conference. I think some 3,000 people attended, and it was made up of a number of speakers uh, speak on various aspects of the issues surrounding the charismatic church, uh, various types of ministries that operate under that umbrella, if you like. But let's first of all hear John MacArthur himself introducing the rationale for the conference. So the effort in this conference these days and with my dear friends who are going to be sharing in opening the Word of God to you and speaking to you is to help you to be discerning. We know there are people who are in this movement who are deceivers and they know they're deceivers. They're false teachers and they know they're false teachers. They're in it for the money and they know they're in it for the money. We also know there are people caught up in the movement who are deceived and may not know they are deceived. They are brands that need to be snatched from the burning, to borrow the words of Jude. There are leaders who need to be confronted and exposed, and there are unwitting leaders who need to be helped and encouraged and to know the truth. We want to be like the noble Bereans. We want to search the Scripture and see if these things are so measuring everything against the Word of God, and that's going to be the effort this week. And as I said a a minute ago, you you really are the chosen. You you have a special seat for this event. Uh, This has never happened, to my knowledge, in the church in my lifetime, where people have come together to think about this issue. How big is it? There are half a billion professed charismatics on the planet, half a billion. To put that in perspective, there are a million Roman Catholics, uh, a billion Roman Catholics. To put that in further perspective, there are 14 million Mormons. 14 million Mormons, half a billion charismatics. It's a massive issue. I don't think anybody would fault pastors for confronting Mormonism, and they should. False view of God, false view of Christ, false view of salvation. Why is it that we have been so reluctant to confront this massive movement that has captivated 500 million plus people? So what we want to do in these days together, and to do it faithfully, and to do it lovingly, and to do it compassionately, but to do it in a very straightforward way, is to help you see the issues for what they are and be discerning. And you then become a force of folks who can help other people to see the light. There you go, John MacArthur speaking at the beginning of his Strange Fire conference in October this year. Well, I'd be interested to hear your thoughts as we continue this discussion today. If you want to get in touch, you can do that by emailing unbelievable at premier.org.uk or you can find us on Twitter and Facebook. Uh, Send us your thoughts that way. You can follow me at unbelievablejb or uh, like the Facebook page, facebook.com slash unbelievablejb. All those links and, of course, links to where you can find out more about the conference and my two guests joining me on the programme today from the website premier.org.uk slash unbelievable. And those guests are um, uh, Pastor Doug Wilson from Christchurch in uh, Moscow, Idaho, and my other guest, Adrian Warnock, um, who's a reformed blogger and writer. They are are both in the Reformed camp as far as their theology is concerned. They share a great deal in common, but they do differ on the gifts of the Spirit. So that's what we're talking about today. Uh, Have the charismatic gifts of the Spirit, prophecy, tongues, and so on, ceased? Did they cease with the closure of the canon of Scripture? And what do we make of the modern charismatic movement? And was John MacArthur right to condemn widely the charismatic movement at this recent conference. Uh, So we do look forward to hearing from you on this issue. Uh, Once again, if you want to email in, unbelievable at premier.org.uk. I can imagine as well people want to pick up the phone on this one. So why don't I give you the number for that as well if you want to leave a voicemail message. 08456 52 52 52 and select the option to leave a voicemail for unbelievable. (music) 
Unbelievable with Justin Brierley. Uh, Adrian, let's come to you first of all as we as we start to open these topics up. I guess you come under that banner of leaders who are rather than deceiving have been deceived and need to be, as it were, brought out and shown the light, as as MacArthur put it. Um, okay, your your overall reaction to, to to this whole thing. Well, to start with, I would say that this is the most divisive intervention I have ever seen in my whole life. Um, I believe that uh, what John MacArthur is actually doing is adding to the gospel because he's saying that in order to be a Christian, and I I know you may be able to share some clips later about this, that in order to be a Christian, you have to not only have faith in Jesus, but you have to have a correct view on the gifts of the Holy Spirit. Uh, And I think this is really very concerning. He believes that um, the gifts ceased. And it's interesting, actually, to hear what uh, your other guest was just saying when he said, well, you know, he felt that the gifts... um, resulted in scripture well I, I don't see that the gifts mentioned in 1 corinthians resulted in scripture i don't see how tongues results in scripture uh, i don't see even how prophecy results in scripture in fact if you think about the new testament there's virtually no prophecy recorded in the new testament at all it's all teaching it's all writings so i i, I actually i think we've got a fundamental difference on definitions because of course um if i was being asked did scripture cease and i'd say absolutely scripture ceased that the revelation of of christ the doctrinal revelation of the bible it came to its end with jesus and with the you know the work of uh, the writing of the new testament and mm. that once the new testament was finished we've got no further if you like that's god's last word to the whole of mankind mm. um so i have no qualms about that but i think we may differ in our definition of spiritual gifts because to me spiritual gifts have got almost nothing to do with writing the bible actually that's interesting doug what do you have to say on that um in second corinthians twelve twelve, paul says the things that mark an apostle signs wonders and various miracles were done among you with great perseverance so i take i take the sign what i call the sign gifts as uh, distinguishing marks of an apostle. And an apostle is someone who can speak the word of God to me, who can tell me this is what God says, this is what Jesus says. So I quite agree that not all the, not all the gifts are uh, revelatory in themselves. So, for example, uh, if you heal someone, if you heal a paralytic, that's not revelatory in itself. But if I saw someone do that, I'm going to listen to what he says because the Bible says that those are that's one of the distinguishing marks of an apostle, the ability to work miracles like that. And so um, the the issue is in the first century there was a cluster of gifts out of which scripture came and which provided the authentic uh, the authentication for us to know that they th- these words were in fact the words of Scripture. So, uh, and just to take a very simple test case, if someone stands up in a charismatic meeting and says, uh, God told me to tell you all this, well, that's either true or false. If it's true, I don't know how to distinguish these words of God just but now spoken and the words of God I was reading in my Bible that morning. The Mm. words of God are the words of God. Okay, so what what would you? How would you treat that kind of a a prophecy that someone says God has given me a word, and is it equivalent to Scripture in your view? Well, no, it's not equivalent to Scripture, um, and I think one Corinthians thirteen's already been mentioned here, and it talks in there about the fact that we know in part and we prophesy in part. Well, there's nothing incomplete about the Scripture. The Scripture is perfect. So when it comes to the Scripture, we can be absolutely confident that what we're reading is the Word of God. Yes, sometimes we can differ about how we interpret it, as indeed we're going to, I'm sure, um, on this very program. Um, But it does talk about the fact that our prophecy is in part. And so I've always believed that the prophetic gift is a partial gift. It's it's like seeing through a glass darkly, as it says in 1 Corinthians 13 as well. But that partial gift, it does say, will stop. So I, I am a cessationist, but if you read the context, it tells us when it will stop. It says it will stop 
when we see Jesus face to face, when we see the perfect, when the perfect comes and we have perfect knowledge of him, there'll be no more need for prophecy at that point. Now, I would see the function of prophecy um, really as to encourage, to comfort and to edify. Uh, and that's, there's a good scriptural warrant for that. And it's interesting, it's, it's, it seems to be different to the function of teaching and to the scriptures, which is about teaching, rebuking, correcting, training in righteousness. So to me, I see two slightly distinct things there. The teaching of the scripture, which is absolute for all time, um, and an application of that to the here and now, if you like, which is about edification, comfort, exhorting, uh, and sometimes yes, direction. And uh, I don't feel that uh, we can usually use the Bible to direct us in terms of decision making, uh, once you've left aside, obviously, moral issues, you know, to know, for example, whether you're supposed to become a preacher or not become a preacher. Um, you know, the Bible doesn't really tell you that. And so sometimes God will put a call on you, will put a sense of him directing you. And it's interesting to me that, that Doug's happy to talk about God directing. I heard him saying that earlier. The prompting of the Holy Spirit yeah. was, was what you said, Doug. And uh, that's what I would call prophecy. Yeah. Okay, well, what's, what, what, give us an example when perhaps you've had an experience, Doug, of a prompting of the Holy Spirit. Would, would you be prepared to share something? Sure. One time I was counselling a, a woman who was thinking seriously about joining a cult. And it was, it was, a, it was a bad, bad cult, immoral people and everything. And I'd spent a few days um, trying to t- talk to her. We, uh, my wife and I, had been flown to another state to to intervene in this particular case, and by a concerned family member. And I was talking to her, and she she was just like a stone wall, and I couldn't figure out what was going on. And um, one morning, I got up and I was reading in Peter. Um, I was reading the NIV at the time, and, and it says, with eyes, speaking of false teachers, it said, with eyes full of adultery, they seduce the unstable. And as soon as I read that, I knew that the husband of the couple that was recruiting this this woman was sleeping with her. Um, and I, I just knew that. And I brought it up to her, and I asked her if this was so, and she dissolved in, you know, into tears. And it was a it was a from the world's standpoint it was a shot in the dark but it was um uh, it was a prophecy doug it was a prophecy huh? that's what it was it was a prophecy no. you no. you you had I... some information that was revealed to you about that person that you couldn't have known in your natural sense so i think in any normal use of the word in english that would be considered prophetic it was a revelation if you like not of doctrine um, but of actually, interestingly, a specific application of that scripture. And I think that's interesting. I would often see prophecy as being a specific application of scripture to a specific situation. So that would be one thing. But the other thing but actually combines there with what you did there, which is that actually sometimes there is some specific knowledge involved. So- Before you respond, Doug, I just want to hear the end of that story. What what happened in the end, if you don't mind sharing with this, this woman? Uh, no, I don't mind. She she dissolved in tears and repented. And, and um, the Lord used that. It was a wonderful... Um, it was a wonderful deliverance, mm. and um, and I'm gr- very grateful to, to God and believe that God uh, put that burden on my heart. But and this is why I would not call it a prophecy. Okay, I would not dream. I would not dream of telling her. God told me that this is what you're doing. But you believe that that God told you what was happening. No, you I, believe I, that. I felt. Oh, let, let, let's say I wake up in the morning and I have a burden to call somebody mm-hmm. um, in the church. I have, I'm their pastor. I, I have the authority to call them, even if it just, sometimes a thought occurs to me, hey, I haven't talked to so-and-so in a while. I have the authority to call them on my own. And I certainly have the authority to call them if I have a burden. To, I, I can't shake this mm. burden to call them. Um, but I wouldn't call them up and say, God told me to call you. Um, because uh, I don't believe I'm a prophet, but I believe I'm a Christian in whom the Holy Spirit dwells, and I I can be uh, I can be steered and directed with these promptings, and sometimes they're right, and sometimes they're sometimes I read them correctly, okay. sometimes I don't read them correctly, and I'm only in trouble if I attach the name of God to them. So if I if I say, "Thus saith the Lord." OK, well, well, I can understand your, your hesitancy there, and probably you can as well. Yeah, Adrian. no, I mean, to be honest, I think most charismatics would probably handle um, something like that in a very similar way. 
Um, precisely. Most charismatics you know, perhaps. Yeah, well, Adrian. most charismatics I know, yes. That's probably fair to say. But most charismatics... I would maybe even go further than that. I mean, it's always difficult uh, because you can only talk about what you know. But um, certainly for me and for the people that I'm, I'm close to, if we feel that God is laying something on us, then we don't normally go up to someone and say, thus saith the Lord. Because I think, you know, go back to that 1 Corinthians 13. We know in part and we prophesy in part. And we're also told um, not to despise prophecies in 1 Thessalonians 5.20, but to take test everything and to hold fast to what is good so i think in this situation doug you know i would test what uh, you said and i would test it one of the ways i would test it is precisely in the sort of way you did which is by by floating it if you like um rather than saying thus saith the lord you just ask the question and one of the marks of the prophetic is the fact that it does pierce people like you described well, I was going to say, you've, you've had an interesting chat. It's available online, and I'll put the link with the program with, with Mark Driscoll on the issue of cessationism, who, who um, is himself a charismatic, um, very similar, I think, to Adrian here in terms of his theology right. on that. Yeah. Um, and Adrian, I don't know if you agree with what the, the way Driscoll put it to, to, to Doug was, you're a charismatic in denial. Yeah, absolutely. <laughs> absolutely. See, right. I, I mean, that's but the as, thing. As long as I'm, I'm, I would be happy with that, as long as I'm <laughs> allowed to return the compliment and say that you are are a cessationist in denial. Well, I, I think, because, but I think this is the problem, okay. isn't it? Because it because depends on how we define if, things. If you define prophecy as scripture writing, then I would hold up my hand and say I'm a cessationist in that sense. But if I'm allowed to define prophecy as a prompting of the Holy Spirit, then perhaps you would uh, agree that you are a charismatic. <laughs> oh, oh, sure. If, if, if what charismatic meant is open to the promptings or leadings or the burdens of the Holy Spirit, um, sure, sign me up. Well, but, we, let, we're going to uh, have to take a quick I, break, jo- folks. Just, just for we, we, we're approaching our first um, uh, short break okay. here, and, okay. and we'll, we'll come back straight back to you, Doug, because I know you want to continue right. your thought there. Um, you're listening to Unbelievable. Really interesting discussion today on the gifts of the Holy Spirit. It's in response to the Strange Fire Conference in the U.S. of A. Uh, John MacArthur, popular Bible teacher out there, has effectively condemned uh, a large part of the Christian Church. He might not call it the Christian Church himself, though. Uh, Non-Christian and heretical, as far as he. Concerned, the charismatic wing of the church, leading people into false doctrine, uh, adi- adding to scripture, um, all kinds of emotionalism, and so on. Well, is he throwing out the charismatic baby with the bathwater, as it's been put by some people? Um, yes, certainly. I think probably lots of people would point to various areas where charismatic and Pentecostal church has overstepped certain scriptural boundaries. But we're discussing this today uh, with a charismatic Adrian Warnock with me here in the studio and a cessationist Doug Wilson on the line. Um, And so we're going to continue this conversation here on Unbelievable in just a moment's time. Do come back. You're listening to Unbelievable on Premier Christian Radio. Welcome back to the programme. Uh, you are listening to the show that aims to get Christians thinking. Uh, this week's programme, very much an inter-Christian discussion. Um, it's being carried out with good grace, but obviously two people who certainly know what they think. Uh, my guests today are Doug Wilson. He's the pastor of Christ Church in uh, Moscow, Idaho. He's a prominent Calvinist writer, blogger. He's a cessationist, though. That means he believes that the charismatic gifts of the Spirit, like prophecy, speaking in tongues, perhaps healing well we'll find out from Doug exactly where he uh, draws these lines Uh, but essentially those charismatic gifts have ceased with the closure of the canon of scripture Uh, we shouldn't be adding to what God has said says Doug well on the other side of this discussion is Adrian Warnock he's a reformed blogger and writer too he's a charismatic though and I'd be interested to find out from Adrian as we continue today's show exactly what he believes he's experienced in terms of the charismatic during his life Uh, so we'll, we'll find all that out and more but this is as I say all in reaction to this controversial conference in the US um, that John MacArthur held called Strange Fire, in which he accused many uh, Christians uh, in the charismatic world of effectively not being Christians, that they have a false gospel, um, that they are being led into error, either intentionally or unintentionally. And we'll hear a bit more from John MacArthur in uh, a panel discussion that took place at the conference during the course of this program. If you want to get in touch yourself, um, perhaps you are a charismatic, perhaps you're a cessationist, be interested to hear from you too. Unbelievable at premier.org.uk if you'd like to send me an email. You can also, of course, follow me on Twitter at UnbelievableJB or um, facebook.com slash UnbelievableJB to uh, send me your thoughts via the Facebook page. 
Um, gentlemen, thank you very much for joining me on the program today. And to continue with you, Doug, um, we sort of had to cut you off slightly in that last section, but you wanted to continue talking about the way that you believe the the gifts do or don't operate um, in today's church. Yeah, I, I, I want to say I'm, I may have been born at night, but it, you know, it wasn't last night. <laughs> and, and I've been around, I, I grew up in the evangelical church, I've been around charismatics uh, my entire adult life in different to different extents and in different ways and in different. Um, I've been in been in the meetings. I've done, seen people doing the deal. I've 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 been there, got the T-shirt, the whole thing. Um, I have seen in recent years a heartening to me a very encouraging and heartening move to reform theology. And you know something to give more structure and substance to what um, has been overwhelmingly, in my experience, a pretty embarrassing mishmash of stuff. And in the middle of this embarrassing mishmash, it is routine for people to claim the authority of Almighty God for their babbling, or for their you know the crazy the crazy thing that they just said, and. I, I had someone come into my office one time to rebuke me for something or other in the name of the Lord. He was coming as a prophet, and he told me that if I didn't do, you know, if I didn't uh, retract or repent or do do whatever it was, our ministry would be closed down uh, by the Lord within a certain period of time. And so I just pushed a piece of paper across the table at him and said, asked him to write that down and sign it for me, sign and date it for me, which he refused to do. <laughs> okay. Um, this, th- there is, uh, and of course, with half a billion people um, involved in this, you're going to have your outliers and the Fruit Loops and stuff. But I've been around it enough to know that there is an awful lot of abuse. It's not as though the mainstream of the charismatic movement is all responsible reform types. So basically you're saying Adrian is the notable exception to what is otherwise a pretty mixed bag. I, I would say a very heartening exception. I, wel- I, I welcome the resurgence of theological and confessional commitments among charismatics. And I believe, if, I believe that is a movement of the Holy Spirit. And I believe that if... Um, even though I differ with responsible charismatics, I believe that they are the ones who should be in the front lines of dealing with the excesses. Mm. Um, so people, so people like uh, John MacArthur don't have to, uh, because he's going to be doing it from a greater distance with less sympathy, mm-hmm. and perhaps he he will paint with too broad a brush. the uh, The abuses are are horrific, and they're being done in the name of God, and. Deuteronomy 13 and Deuteronomy 18 indicates that people who carry on like that should should uh, be um, treated more seriously than just a crazy uncle. Okay, let's come back to you, Adrian, here, because um, I'm sure you would agree that there are abuses, obviously, within oh, the charismatic church. Oh, for sure. I mean, there are abuses. But I think one of the challenges we face is that there is no <clears throat> movement as such. People talk about the charismatic movement uh, as though it was, I don't know, a denomination like the Presbyterians or something. And uh, the reality is there's a plethora of um, denominations and groups and you know, sometimes people talk about networks or families of churches, um, and uh, each of them really are fairly independent. Um, and so when you talk about dealing with these people, um, often it's it's actually quite difficult because a lot of these people are not under anyone's authority, actually. They're their own ministry. Um, they, they, they may not have a connection to the church um, as a whole. And I think that is a bit of a concern. And, and for me, you know, I would love to see um, anyone who who puts themselves forward as some kind of minister uh, for the gospel, some kind of preacher, some kind of uh, evangelist, to to be rooted and grounded in a church that can provide them with discipline and can provide them with accountability. So for me personally, it's a delight that I'm part of Jubilee Church. Now, there, there are, obviously, you're part of a network, and there's yeah. a kind of an accountability structure and so exactly. on. But but networks can all kind of sometimes come be influenced by movements. For instance, okay, um, back in the early 90s, there was the... Toronto blessing sure. as it was called and and many churches charismatic churches mm-hmm. of, of different kinds were um going over to Toronto apparently being filled with the spirit um obviously there was mm-hmm. lots of manifestations tongues uh, falling over in the spirit 
But there was also, you know, claimed to be rather strange things like people barking like dogs and, and this sort of thing. Now, what did you make of that particular movement of the spirit? Do you believe it was? And what do you make of some of the stranger stories that were coming out of that particular movement? Well, I think that, you know, some of that movement was definitely a movement of God. I really believe that, having, you know, lived through it and experienced some of it. Um, but I think that, you know, when God's spirit moves, it's often a very emotional time. Um, there's a you know high emotional response, if you like. Um, and so sometimes people will overreact, if you like, to that emotion. And so I think some of the things, especially perhaps some of the more bizarre things, are around that kind of disinhibition, around that over-emotionalism, uh, and are quite extreme. And it's very interesting because there's nothing new about that. If you go back to Jonathan Edwards' time, um, he wrote a book called The Religious Affections, which I'd encourage anyone to, to read if they're interested in some of the history of this and also a very good way of handling it. He goes through a number of tests in one from out of John, 1 John uh, um, that really help you to determine whether or not a particular move is of the of the Holy Spirit. And one of the things he says in there is it's neither a sign that it is or that it isn't if some of these bizarre things happen. And he saw some pretty bizarre things in some of his uh, meetings as well. Um, I mean, including, I think, his wife who would uh, fall into a trance uh, and all kinds of stuff like that. And he, he refused to reject it all, but he was quite clear that uh, some of it is, is not necessarily of the spirit. Some of it may even be demonic, but I think most of the time it's just of the flesh or or even just sometimes imitation. I think people will copy each other. I, th- I think what's fair to say as well is that even if many churches aren't explicitly having very obvious manifestations, the charismatic movement as a whole has influenced very, very widely just in sure. terms of worship styles yep. and that kind of thing. I mean, now, Doug, personal question. Do people put their hands in the air in your church when they're singing worship songs or hymns? Well, I have to qualify it. The answer, <laughs> the quick answer is yes, but we don't do it. We, we do it all together as a liturgical act. Okay, so, so it's, it's at the given uh, time, uh, as it were, yeah. that everyone knows so, that... Uh, uh, it's when we're singing the Gloria Patri. We conclude the service with the Gloria Patri, and and everybody lifts their hands in the Gloria Patri. Um, and we do that because in our wing of the Reformed world, many times people think that God gave us bodies so that Reformed people would have something to walk their brains to church. <laughs> um, yeah, but so, I mean, it's, it's biblical, you know, isn't it? I mean, the Psalms tell us to lift our hands, sure. to clap, to kneel, to dance even. Uh, and it talks about, you know, loud music and symbols and all sorts of things like that in the Psalms. And so yeah. we, we would we argue have, that charismatic uh, worship is just purely biblical, really. Right. Now, we, but there, there are several, there are other things that go with this. We kneel in confession, for example. Yeah. We, have a, we have a choir and we have strings and we have kettle drums. And, you know, so uh, we're... We're into it, but we don't do contemporary, what's called contemporary worship music. But it's it's loud, and we worship with our bodies, and we stand, and we, we stand, and we kneel. But what I'm getting hands. from you here, Doug, is that it's not necessarily what is probably part of what defines charismatic worship, which is this idea of being spontaneous, uh, which is, you know, that, that it could go off in different directions. We're not working to a script here. God could move right. in the meeting in a way that's totally unexpected. We could, the, 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 the pastor could ditch his sermon because he's just felt like God's given him a special word. You know, it, it's that kind of feel that I'm, I'm guessing Adrian is probably pretty used to in many of the services he's attending, and which probably doesn't characterize your kind of a service. Would that be fair to say, I think, that, I think that would be fair. As a, as a general, I, I would hope that in some remarkable situation, we'd be willing to scratch the liturgy that we have to, to address the, you know, this thing that we have to address. But as a general pattern, week after week, uh, we have liturgical worship. And the, we, we believe we fix the walls of the, of the channel, and we want the water to flow vigorously in that channel. Um, so that we want the preaching to be forceful and robust and the singing to be forceful and robust. But it's, um, it's formal worship. Yes, absolutely. So, so now, do you have a problem with that, Adrian? Do, does that stifle in any way the work of the Spirit within the congregation? Well, I think there's nothing wrong with having a order of service, if you like. I mean, we would tend to do that, especially in a larger church context. Um, there's nothing wrong with a bit of structure and a bit of order. I mean, the Bible tells us that 
you know, all things are to be done in decently and in order, although the context of that verse does talk about the gifts of the Spirit and that all of those should be done decently and in order. So, I mean, I think for many charismatic churches, um, Sunday mornings are not necessarily quite the sort of wild fest that you might imagine um, because, you know, there are visitors there, there are no unbelievers there, um, and, and so we are um, perhaps cautious, not cautious, it's not the right word, but we are careful to uh, to worship God in a decent way, uh, but at the same time open to the Spirit's leading. I think often it's in the smaller meetings, maybe if you're a smaller church that might be your Sunday meeting or it may be in other contexts, so for us it's it's in our prayer meetings that, that these kind of things will happen more, if you like, and, and would expect more of the gifts of the Spirit, perhaps also one-to-one. Do you, do you personally speak in tongues, Adrian? Yes, I do. Okay, now what's happening for you when when you speak in tongues okay well i think for me um i i, I do like the verse um that talks about uh, the spirit interceding with groans that words can't express because i think that expresses it quite nicely so i think for me very often you know you'll be worshiping or you'll be praying um and you know rising up within you is a, is a, a desire to praise god and you find that words just run out and so you find yourself speaking um these words that you know sound like nonsense sound like gibberish but um you're not too bothered about exactly what those words are because your heart is just rising up in in praise and in worship uh, to god uh, and at that time it, it's it, it does seem to stimulate your faith it does seem to uh, encourage you to well the bible talks about it um edifying you or building you up in, in your in your holy faith and that, that seems to do that and often it also leads to a release of other gifts as well um, so we'll often, you know, be using these uh, in a kind of c- context of prayer, really. And and in that sense, it's it's more of um, a devotional yes. type of use of, of tongues yeah. rather than being prophetic. Um, uh, though I'm sure that yeah. you've seen that happen yeah. as well, where where yeah. someone's given a um, uh, said something in tongues and someone else has given an interpretation. Sure, sure. No, I have seen that as well. Yeah, Doug, what do you make of the gift of tongues? What's going on um, my- when someone when Adrian talks in tongues? I believe that in Acts two, in Acts two, the word that's used, one of the words that's used um, for tongues there. We, there's obviously glossolalia, but you've got uh, uh, the word that we get dialect from. I believe that the gift of tongues in the first century was the supernatural impartation of a language that the person, that the speaker, had not acquired by ordinary means, growing up with it or studying it later. He just suddenly found himself speaking um, Latin or speaking a language he'd not learned. That's what I think it was in the first century. And I believe that tongues plus interpretation equals prophecy. So it's the, the speaker is saying something, he doesn't know what it is, and someone else in the room uh, is able to interpret it. And I believe that interpreted message is a message from God equivalent to prophecy. Now, when... When you have uh, tongue speaking, since, since I believe that that miraculous gift has ceased, and I and I've studied a number of languages and and you know have a an understanding of how they function, um, I would say what's going on under the heading of tongues in um, in most charismatic circles, the, what I have seen, I would say it is I would describe it as an ecstatic utterance of jumbled syllables that is cathartic, emotionally cathartic, and the person feels better, but I don't think it's a language. And in that sense, it's not given by God? Correct. Correct. I don't think it's a supernatural gift from God. Now, I don't know uh, where, it, it, wh- wh- whether you know what John MacArthur's position on tongues is, but... but... I, I think, could I imagine he him. Have... He believes it's even possibly demonic. Of in some well, way. I'm not sure, but he, I, he certainly would believe that the biblical gift, gift of tongues was uh, other languages from Acts two. Um, but what's interesting is in one Corinthians, uh, Paul talks about t- the gift of interpretation being a supernatural gift, and it's always struck me as a bit odd uh, that if all tongues are, um, are are natural languages, if you like, that you would ever need a supernatural gift of interpretation. Because certainly in Acts two, they didn't. In Acts two. 
you know, people were speaking in, in languages in order to evangelize. But it seems to me that's the only time in the Bible where that's the case. I mean, Paul talks about speaking in tongues more than anybody, and yet there's no record that he was ever given a, a, a different language, or indeed that he would have needed to be because he spoke Greek, so most of the people he would have just spoken Greek to. So it does seem that he was heavily involved in a personal prayer language because he did not want to speak in tongues in church. He even says that. He says, I don't, you know, I'd rather not speak in, in tongues in church. And yet he says, I thank God that I speak in tongues more than all of you. So you think, well, where is he doing that? It must be in his own sort of personal time. Well, I, I do believe that Paul did not speak in tongues in church. And I do believe he spoke in tongues more than them all. And I believe that that would have to be uh, in his, his own devotional time, either privately or with his, you know, the, the prayer meeting of the, the, his lieutenants, the men with him, that, that sort of thing, the, the prayer meeting in his house. And do you agree that that was probably a sort of personal prayer language, angelic language, rather than a, a natural tongue? Yeah, well, he, I believe he, he does refer to, in First Corinthians 13, if I speak with the tongues of men and of angels. Hmm. Um, so there's the possibility of an angelic language. But I don't know of any, um, uh, I don't know of any reading of the words used to describe those tongues or languages that does not refer to a, a, a language with syntax, grammar, vocabulary, um, and an ability to be interpreted. So, uh, in his in his uh, uh, prayer language. It wouldn't be a non-language. It's a prayer language, not a not an unlanguage. Here's what John MacArthur says about tongues. Um, in his from quoting from his book, he says, "When an entire movement is defined by a heterodox theology that threatens the purity of the church by tolerating and even promoting false forms of the gospel, it must be boldly confronted." I do believe that modern tongues is an unsafe spiritual practice. So. But Paul says, I want you all to speak in tongues and even more to prophesy. And he says, earnestly desire to prophesy and do not forbid speaking in tongues. Both of those quotes from 1 Corinthians 14. I'd sooner listen to Paul than John MacArthur, frankly. Okay. <laughs> what, what, well, but, but, you, well, you're, but Adrian, uh, there you're begging the question. Of course, <laughs> John MacArthur would agree that at the time Paul wrote those words, that everybody should. That's what Paul wanted. But the the issue is whether that option has. So, so what, but, but, what, what, but do you see how hmm. much of a problem I have? Because I'm a real believer in sola scriptura, okay, just like you. Um, and I believe that our doctrine should come out of Scripture. And I believe that when Scripture has clear commands, especially in the New Testament, we are to follow them. Um, and I do not understand anywhere in the Bible where those commands were rescinded. So you have to understand that for me, as a simple believer, you know, maybe I've got this wrong, but I will stand before God and I will say to God, well, God, I read these these words, uh, you know, I, I took them as being relevant for today and I tried to follow them. I, I really don't think God's going to punish me as a blasphemer against the Holy Spirit uh, as a result, I mean, would you agree with that, that with MacArthur's, uh, you know, statement that we will all be basically damned, it would seem, I mean, because blasphemy against the Holy Spirit is an unforgivable sin? Yeah, the one, the one uh, let me start with, with that. The one clip I saw of MacArthur um, uh, saying, basically saying, relegating charismatics to an unsaved status, I thought uh, at best was carelessly and clumsily stated, and at worst, was outrageous. So, um, well, thank so you for saying that. I mean, I really <laughs> okay. appreciate you saying that, Doug, to be honest, because this has been the reason why we've been so hurt. You know, uh, quotes like from the book, the entire movement is nothing more than a sham religion run by counterfeit ministries, the entire movement note. Um, and then he talks about well, it's in the same category as cult groups like Seventh Day Adventists, Mormons and JWs, a false religion. He says that charismatics are in eternal jeopardy. Uh, he says it falsely calls itself an evangelical movement. Uh, and then again, you know, the blasphemy against the Holy Spirit. And for readers wanting to find those quotes, page 71, page 81, page 128, page 113 of the book. And, and those kind of comments, they rile me up, to be quite honest, because I think it's really wrong to add to the gospel in that way and to say that if you don't believe with me, John MacArthur, about the gifts of the Holy Spirit, you're essentially an unbeliever. And basically my response to that, having said that I think at best that clip was clumsily stated and at worst it was outrageous because I've, I've met many, many, many charismatics who were A, people who loved the Lord Jesus Christ, uh, believed in the Trinity, the triune God, would agree with the Apostles' Creed, 
They're not they're not like Mormons or JWs or whatever. Those same people, those sweet Christians, oftentimes do very very embarrassing things. And uh, and I would go back to I was I was glad you cited Jonathan Edwards because I was about to I was thinking of Jonathan Edwards right before you brought him up. Uh, Jonathan Edwards was a friend of the Great Awakening. He he made his name by uh, writing his book on the on the revival in Northampton. But then, as the the Great Awakening got fruitier and fruitier, uh, uh, Jonathan Edwards, who was a leader and a promoter of that revival, took the lead in um, in rebuking the excesses and defining what true religion looked like in this context. And uh, and so when we have uh, when we have the embarrassments that are routinely trotted out in front of the non-believing world of the Benny Hens and the Pat Robertsons and the, the, the you know they're just they're just cringeworthy um, at some and point, I would agree okay, okay so so I'm glad you I'm glad you would agree with that and I believe that if responsible reformed charismatics even given the differences we have were sort of policing the boundaries and saying that's out of bounds there would be there wouldn't be this energy that's pent up on the non-charismatic side that uh, that supported um, the strength or the vehemence of the of the strange fire uh, rhetoric. Mm. Uh, I mean, let's let's take another clip quickly uh, while we've time from John MacArthur. This is this is uh, from the Strange Fire Conference during a panel discussion, um, and and this is them talking about the fact that he'd received a number of criticisms for putting on the conference. This is why I believe that. We are not dividing the body of Christ in this conference. We are trying to identify the body of Christ and show that these people aren't part of it. I think the big issue here, you know, uh, people have been hitting the Twitter thing all day, and it was kind of interesting. They told me today that it was the number one hashtag Twitter thing in the world, Strange Fire Conference. One of the criticisms that coming is, this is divisive, these are our brothers, these are our sisters in Christ, they're not. Should we be happy about that? No, we ought to be heartbroken about that. If we want to talk about fire, then we need to talk about snatching brands from the burning. Uh, These people need to be rescued, and one of the reasons that we did this, there's two things in my mind driven toward this conference. One was the terrible dishonor of the Holy Spirit so that the reproaches that fall on him are fallen on me. Um, Zeal for your house has eaten me up, what Jesus said when he cleansed the temple. And secondly, the, the, the reality that these people are lost in this system, and they're throwing the word Jesus all over the place. They don't know the gospel. They don't understand the gospel. So, you know, I got to thinking about that today, and, and I decided that <clears throat> on Sunday morning here, I'm going to give a message on the true gospel and who's really saved. Because at the end of the day, this becomes the issue. And I will tell you this, that people can't be saved out of that movement until they hear the gospel. They can't call on the one they don't know. They can't know him unless they hear it. Because this is such an important issue, I am certain with the people sitting here, they might say, Dr. MacArthur, though I know some people, and yeah, it's wacky and it's goofy, but I think they love the Lord, and they're so nice, and they would tell you that they're actually a Christian. Yeah, well, so would the Mormons. And they're very nice, and they have nice families, and they dress nice, and they have short hair, and they wear suits. They, wear, <laughs> they dress like you. Wow. Okay, Adrian, you, you were shaking your head in almost disbelief at some of yeah, that. Yeah. So I, what's your... What, yeah, go on. I mean, I just think it's a tragedy that uh, a respected minister of the gospel would speak such a way... Um, and would talk in such a way. And, and I think there's a real risk that he may, um, well, he may derail his ministry, to be honest, by this kind of intervention. And I think it's a shame because MacArthur has a lot to offer the church. I believe the church needs MacArthur. Uh, and I think MacArthur's uh, preaching, uh, and I know you have that here on the ra- Premier Radio, is excellent. And I think it'd be an absolute tragedy if the main result of this would be many, many charismatics who actually do listen to MacArthur and value his teaching were to wholesale reject him and perhaps even reject the, the theology that he represents, which would be a tragedy. Do, do you think that in that clip, for instance, Doug, that MacArthur overstepped the line uh, comparing charismatics to Mormons, um, saying that this is about who's saved? I mean, he's made this a salvation issue, it sounds like. 
Yes, that, that was the clip I was referring to when I said at the the best case scenario, listening to that, he's painting with way too broad a brush. And worst case scenario, it's outrageous. So uh, I understand that Phil Johnson said he was not saying this about each and every charismatic or he was not saying that it was impossible to be a charismatic and be saved, um, which would put his statement at the that was way too broad a brush um, mm. statement. And I think that if that were the case, then I think John MacArthur needs to come out and say it. There will be there will be um, hundreds of thousands of charismatics in the resurrection with me. There, there are many, many saved people among the among the charismatics. So I thought I think that that was way too broad a brush. Okay, we're going to have to take another quick break, uh, and we'll be starting to wrap things up. Um, time has flown by, as it always does on the program. Uh, you're listening to a debate today, a uh, friendly discussion, really, uh, on the issue of the charismatic gifts of the Spirit. Are they for today? Have they ceased with the closure of the canon of Scripture? Doug Wilson and Adrian Warnock on two sides of today's discussion as we look back at the strange fire conference which has generated so much controversy, especially in the States. You're listening to Unbelievable with me, Justin Briley. Welcome back to the final part of Unbelievable with me, Justin Briley, this Saturday afternoon. And don't forget, if you're a regular listener to Faith Explored on Saturday afternoons, which Unbelievable is one part of, uh, you can actually listen back to Unbelievable online. Lots of people do each week. Premier.org.uk slash Unbelievable to get the podcast details, to subscribe, to find past programmes and indeed links to my guests on today's programme. And we'll be hearing the final part of a discussion on the strange fire conference and book in just a moment's time uh, later on uh, today this afternoon you're going to be hearing the profile interview i'm in conversation today with no none other than rowan williams the former archbishop of canterbury so fascinating stories he has to tell about his time in office some of the highs and lows of trying to hold the anglican communion together between four and five this afternoon here on premier and come back next week for Unbelievable, uh, completely changing gears to another topic altogether as we look at intelligent design. And one of the foremost proponents of intelligent design in the world, Stephen C. Meyer, joins me on the program to talk about his new and, of course, controversial book, uh, Darwin's Doubt. Uh, it claims that the Cambrian explosion was, in fact, um, a evidence for uh, an intelligent source of all these new life forms that came into being. Uh, well, that, of course, has been hotly disputed by leading evolutionists. And uh, we're going to be having one of them on the program to debate with him. It's going to be Charles Marshall, who's based out in uh, Berkeley, California. So uh, if you are into that kind of area of intelligent design and the evidence for and against, you will not want to miss next week's program. It's a barnstormer. I can assure you of that. Uh, Premier.org.uk slash unbelievable to listen back. Uh, come back Saturday at 2.30 p.m. if you want to listen in live to that discussion. OK, we've been talking about the charismatic church. Let's get into the final part of our debate here today on the show. You're listening to Unbelievable on Premier Christian Radio. Yes, it's in response to a recent conference in the States held by John MacArthur. He's a cessationist and he's been certainly not mincing his words as regards his thoughts about the charismatic church, which comprises some half a billion people around the world. Now, it's a mixed bag. That's certainly what we've been hearing from one of my guests, Adrian Warnock. But that doesn't mean we throw the baby out with the bathwater. Even if there are abuses, it doesn't mean that God isn't working in supernatural ways through gifts of tongues, prophecy, healing and so on. Um, and of course, uh, on the other side of the discussion, we've had Pastor Doug Wilson of Christ Church in uh, Moscow, Idaho, who is a cessationist. He believes that those gifts have ceased, even though he says, yes, I still believe we can be led by the Holy Spirit. There's promptings of the Holy Spirit, but let's not call them prophecy. Um, that would be to add to scripture. OK, um, Adrian, we've heard actually, <laughs> interestingly, more from Doug in this uh, conversation so far about promptings, leadings of the Holy Spirit and so on. Can you give examples where, which you think experientially confirm for you yeah. that God does still 
move through supernatural signs and wonders in this day and age? Sure. I thought the um, example that I'd most like to share with you really is a a story that affects our church. So um, my church had been going about, I don't know, 13, 14 years. Uh, We'd grown to about 100 people um, and we were beginning to look for somewhere else to meet and uh, we were struggling a bit. Um, but we were praying about that. Um, the, the building we were in, we weren't quite full, but, you know, we were feeling it was time to mm. move on. Um, and, and what was interesting was that uh, the, the then sort of new lead elder had a number of people come to him, three or four, I think, and say, it's a bit odd. Um, I was praying um, and I just felt maybe God might want us to move to the cinema. And, you know, when he got to about the third or fourth of these, and in his own prayer time, he was feeling perhaps that was the way God was leading as well. He st- started to think, well, perhaps I should start to do something about this. So just quietly, he talked to the other leaders. And uh, just again, quietly, we began to explore with the cinema uh, whether we might be able to, to, to rent the property to see whether it was a possibility or not. At this point, we hadn't told anyone else in the church, just just a few of the leaders. And what we decided to do um, was just to take a small step and to try and hire a room in the cinema to run an alpha course as it happens. So we then had a prayer meeting to pray for this alpha course. And it was a, 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 a meeting that I'll never forget because during that meeting, two or three people who were not the sort of people that would normally share prophetic words in the church and who knew nothing about the conversations that we've been having said things like this. One of them said, I, I just saw... Um, a picture and I saw our church logo next to the cinema's logo on their building. Bit of an odd thing to say. We were just praying for an alpha course. These were people who knew nothing of these events. They knew nothing of these events, Mm. yeah. Um, And then the second one uh, that I remember, I think there were two or three others that I don't remember, but the one that I do remember said this, said, I believe that God is saying that one day that cinema will be more known uh, for the preaching of the gospel uh, than for being a cinema. Again, a very odd thing to say when we were just praying for a small alpha course. Um, and as I say, after a couple of other of these kind of comments, um, with tears in his eyes, um, Toppy said to, to, to this is your lead this pastor. Is our lead pastor, said mm. to the church uh, that was gathered, said, look, I don't know how to say this. I wasn't planning on telling you this at the moment, but we've been considering uh, l- looking into moving the church there. Um, and of course, this whole uh, moment, you know, convinced us that God was the one speaking to us. Um, and it was good that he did, because we couldn't have been sure that this would happen. Of course, it was a risky move for us it was firstly that, you know, God provided the money for us to pay the, the enhanced rent. It was a, you know, a lot more that, that, than we were, you know, we were paying at the time. But secondly, God pressed the fast forward button. And if you move uh, now, just a few years later, you know, we're a rapidly growing church, we have well over a 1000 people gathered gathering on a Sunday morning. Uh, we're now in Enfield and in Wood Green down the road. And actually hundreds of people have responded to the gospel in that cinema uh, and in the other cinema that we're now in as well. And I just it just beggars belief to me that that would somehow be inspired by Satan. Why would the devil encourage us to move into a venue that, that would then be filled with people who each week would be responding to the gospel? Um, and, you know, as I say, every week, Enfield Cinema and at Wood Green, there we are, the gospel's going out, and it's all really because of prophetic okay. words. Do, do you believe, Doug, that the Holy Spirit was present there enabling people to have these special pictures and revelations in in adrian's prayer meeting um i don't believe that it was the holy spirit operating through the revelatory gifts that are described in the new testament as sign gifts but that doesn't mean that i don't believe it was god (laughs) right so um and this is something we didn't have a chance to to really develop but i I do want to mention it go ahead Um, one one book I've read that's uh, a lot of fun. Um, forgotten the gent's uh, name who wrote it, but the the book is provocatively titled "Dogs That Know When Their Owners Are Coming Home." <laughs> um, and there was another recent story about uh, an elephant trainer in Africa who had been rehabilitating elephants and releasing them into his preserve. Who, when he eventually died, all the elephants um, from many, many miles around, just gathered at his house and mourned for a couple of days. Um, so w- I don't believe that those elephants had the gift of prophecy no. or the gift of a gift of knowledge. But I do believe we live in a personal world governed by God that is not a deistic, enlightenment, empty matter, blind forces grinding away kind of world. Mm. I believe God governs the world personally, and I believe all kinds of weird things happen. I think weird things happen 
not to non-Christians and to Christians both. I think that I think that there are a lot of things that are. It's not bogus or trickery, but it's not the the sign. It's not the kind of sign gift that Second Corinthians twelve twelve says distinguishes an apostle, a person with apostolic authority. Hmm. That's that's my concern. So I don't have a cat. Basically, I don't have a category in my brain for thus saith the Lord in the Bible and thus saith the Lord not in the Bible. I don't I don't have a category in my mind for deutero revelatory. Hmm. We are drawing to a close. Uh, we've we've had some really interesting instructions from both of you gentlemen. Um, thank you very much for for being involved in today's program. Um, what's interesting is, in a way, that some of, in a sense, MacArthur's closest people theologically are, are perhaps a little bit nervous about, as you say, this intervention, because people like John Piper, yeah. and Mark Driscoll, and, and others who you could say are uh, of a similar frame of mind as far as their Reformed theology goes, don't deny the, the operation of, of certain gifts and so on. They yeah. wouldn't describe themselves as cessationist. Uh, and so w- do you see that, in general the Reformed Church is moving down the path of being open to the charismatic gifts, that, that John MacArthur become a bit of an outpost of, of, of a movement that, that is actually on its last legs? Well, I, I think that, to be honest, this is likely to accelerate that. Uh, what's interesting to me is that in the sovereignty of God, um, this seems to be actually giving more confidence to charismatics to speak out. It's also bringing charismatics together. Um, we're often a very disparate group, and I've met a number of uh, you know, significant charismatic leaders who I'd, I'd not really spoken to before or would have encountered before. And I think you know, there's a certain amount of common cause being formed. But I think what's interesting is that there's always been um, odd experiences in the church all the way through the centuries, you know, things like the prophecy that Huss had about Luther. And we could talk about that for hours, but there's never really been an explanatory framework. And I think that's pretty obvious listening to Doug. He doesn't really have an explanatory framework for these kinds of experiences. And I think that's what the charismatic movement offers us. It offers us some biblical language and some biblical principles to use but in we, we maybe need things. to do more theology of the charismatic in that sense, because yes. because it can be used as a bit of a uh, it, it can be abused. And, and oh, no for sure. And, I mean, you know, if people are interested in really getting into the theology, there's, there's probably no one better than Wayne Grudem and his systematic theology uh, or some of his other books as well um, to explain some of the, you know, the, the roots for some of the ideas that I have. Although I believed these things before I ever read his book. Sure. Uh, Doug, a final word as we just close out today's programme. I, I get the feeling that obviously you're, you're not as far down the road as, as John MacArthur is on this. but but And, and you obviously accept that um sort of sensible charismatics you can work with uh, and you equally believe there are cessationists who go too far in the other direction but you'd like to see more breaks on the sort of spirit filled bus as it were occasionally yes i would like to see i would like to see more breaks i'd like to see charismatic responsible charismatics policing their own ranks more effectively i'd like this i'd like to encourage res- what i'm calling the responsible charismatics to give John MacArthur a pass on this. He's a faithful servant of Christ, preached faithfully for many years. I differ with the way he's expressed himself on this issue. But charismatics have long practice with giving a pass to people who do weird things. Or, you know, you know. so uh, I, would, I would encourage them to not take it to heart. Give him, a, give him a pass. He's a faithful servant of Christ on this issue. Engage and dis- differ where... You, you have a difference. I would differ with him in the way he expressed that. But I do want to, insi- I do want to insist that this, um, uh, this uh, conference that they had didn't come from nowhere. Um, Adrian says that, you know, this is encouraging charismatics to speak out. Look, guys, you, there's a half a billion of you. You know, how many conservative evangelical Presbyterians are there? <laughs> come on. <laughs> yeah, I, in, my, in my experience, Charismatics have not needed to be encouraged to speak out at all. Okay. Um, (laughs) (laughs) We are going to draw things to a close. Great to have you on the program today, Doug. And if if you want to find out more about Doug and his ministry, why not visit his blog? That's at DougWills.com, DougWills.com. Adrian Warnock is available from AdrianWarnock.com. 
his Patheos blog, uh, which is very popular. And um, you can, of course, find today's programme available at uh, the website of Unbelievable. That's premier.org.uk slash unbelievable links to today's guests of course to the strange fire material that we've been mentioning today as well and um, and more besides so uh, again thanks to both my guests joining me on the program today well i wonder what you thought of today's program be interested to get your responses too and we'll be hearing some of your uh, thoughts on recent programs in a moment's time uh, you've been listening to unbelievable with me justin briley my guests today were doug wilson and adrian warnock Unbelievable with Justin Brierley. Well, just before we get to some of your responses to the last couple of weeks of programming, I'd just like to make it clear that we did invite John MacArthur and any other representative from Grace to you to be part of this discussion, but they declined. But we're leaving the door open for any kind of right of reply response, and I'll certainly broadcast that if and when it comes in. Uh, I mentioned at the start of the programme that I've written an article recently on Benny Hinn, who is certainly one of the healing evangelist type of ministries that I think MacArthur had his sights set on in this conference. Uh, controversial figure. I went to one of his miracle rally nights in London in the summer. I wrote it up as an article for Christianity magazine. I'm going to put the link to the online version of that with today's programme at premier.org.uk slash unbelievable if you're interested in reading that too um thanks to those who've been getting in touch and if you want to do that yourself email unbelievable at premier.org.uk you can also follow me on twitter at unbelievable jb send me a message that way if you like and facebook.com slash unbelievable jb one of those things that i've been able to be talking about this last week on facebook is the fact that it's been the 50th anniversary of c.s lewis's death that happened on friday the 22nd of november uh, coincides with jfk's death as well in fact and um, i was able to be at the both the memorial service at westminster abbey where a special memorial to lewis was unveiled in poet's corner but also at the symposium that was held the previous day by westminster abbey where a number of uh, speakers were present uh, it was great to be there and to meet some unbelievable listeners which i wasn't expecting but uh, several people um, made themselves known to me as i was wandering around and it was great to see some of them including a young Roman Catholic called Ryan Schinkel, who told me in the shadow of Westminster Abbey about how the show has been part of his journey from atheism to faith. Uh, so I, I caught some of that on mic. Ryan, I hear you're an unbelievable listener, which is good. How long have you been listening? Probably about two and a half, nearly three years. And I always listen to some of the past podcasts that I haven't heard yet. I was one of your new atheist types. And... I got interested in the debate about science, religion, God, reason, just any kind of issue. I was originally a village atheist. I went to a Catholic high school. But I was always interested in the issues and the discussion. And when I came upon Unbelievable, I found there was a wealth of resources, uh, sort of uh, a golden mine in a desert. And, and I came upon I'm like, this is mine, all mine. <laughs> and uh, I mind it listening, and I have way too much time on my hands, so I've listened to, I think, three-fifths of all the shows you've ever had. And I found the Christian worldview more and more persuasive as my intellectual pilgrimage went on. I was someone, I'm a f philosophy student as well as a, a creative writing student. And I found that on Unbelievable, there was a good balance of dealing with the existential side of Christianity, as well as what are the good arguments for and against it. And always dealing with these different issues go uh, fully explored. Nothing is left untouched. And I felt that if Christians were willing to go this far out to the uh, farthest reaches of the intellectual life and to see how Christianity can stand against the staunchest critics, I thought that maybe there's something here. It suggested to me, maybe not in the most conscious way, but kind of in an unconscious manner, that this is something worth taking a look at because people are so willing to risk themselves in terms of debate and dialogue that if it can go this far, maybe it extends with all of reality because truth extends with all of reality. And for me, Unbelievable uh, was a very important part of my spiritual formation, realizing that Christianity extends with all of reality because it is reality.
Well, it was a great pleasure to be able to meet Ryan and indeed a number of others, including Max Andrews and your friend JT and, and others who I bumped into. Quite a few um, visiting Americans who had come over specifically for the, the commemoration service at Westminster Abbey. A big thank you also to those who have been so complimentary about the uh, screw tape thoughts that uh, went out on Inspirational Breakfast this last week. I uh, wrote and uh, recorded a number of devotionals but in the voice of one of c.s lewis's most famous literary creations the screw tape the devil and uh, we called them thought of the devil in fact um and uh, if you want to listen back to those you can actually find them online as well that's at premier.org.uk slash thought premier.org.uk slash thought let's go to some of your responses to the last week or so of programming um Firstly, um, in response to today, well, knowing that we were having a debate on uh, cessationism today, Gabriel got in touch to say, I grew up in a Pentecostal tradition in the States, and from my experience, no, virtually no one in the laity knows about their view historically. <clears throat> I'm personally a continuationist, that means you do believe in the gifts of the Spirit for today, but my views on the gifts being around today are much more nuanced than they were many years ago. I've also noticed a great measure of anti-intellectualism among many in the Pentecostal movement, but I know that's not necessarily particularly to one's view on this issue. Now, uh, Maria um, wanted to talk about last week's show on Mormonism, says, just finish listening to your show with the two Mormons. Excellent. I love most everything about your show. Sometimes it's just too painful to listen to, though, but that's not your fault. And I loved the screw tape thought as well. Uh, you're doing quality work, and obviously God has called you to be exactly where you are. Thank you very much. Appreciate that. And also your offer to pray for the program, Maria. Um, Nathan in California says, I love the show. As a lifelong and active Mormon, the message of Brian Hales that the LDS Church is not in a faith crisis did not resonate with me. Now, Nathan's referring to the topic of last week's program where we were looking at the story of Hans Matson, a prominent leader in the European wing of the Latter-day Saint Church who's gone public with his doubts about the uh, Mormon faith. And Brian Hales was our Mormon representative, as it were, defending the record of Mormon. Um, so uh, you say uh, that the, the message that the LDS Church is not in a state of faith crisis didn't resonate with me. The former LDS Church historian Marlin Jensen, a high ranking leader in the church, recently stated we have never had a period of I'll call it apostasy, like we're having right now. Largely over these issues, we realise that people get their information basically from Google. We're trying to create an offering that will address these historical issues and be available to the public at large and to church leaders, because many of them don't have answers either. It can be very disappointing to church members and for people who are losing their faith or who have lost it. We hope to regain to the church. Brian seems to be in denial, continues Nate, of the fact that we are facing a very huge turning point in the church, and if it's not a faith crisis, I don't know what to term it. Adam from Minnesota says, I was a bit disappointed with the programme. I don't believe your Mormon guest Brian Hales really delivered any solid answers to Russ's questions. What about the lack of archaeological evidence to substantiate the Book of Mormon's writings? Brian seemed to sidestep the issue by dismissing it as a straw man fallacy. Uh, furthermore, I couldn't believe that Brian went through the entire programme without addressing Russ's statement concerning Jesus' words about not being married after the resurrection of the saints. Now, others um, weren't so impressed with Russ, Russ's um, uh, sort of offerings on the show. Brandon in Delaware, who's a Mormon, says, I want to give you a lot of credit for having a great scholar like Brian Hales on. I was disappointed with the ex-Mormon evangelist you had in the show. He didn't seem very well informed on the issues. Surprising, because he is a former Mormon who lives out in Utah. Uh, he constantly referred to other people's websites most of his issues were copy and paste questions which have been answered time and again by Mormon apologists. He constantly went off topic. Uh, I myself am a convert to the Church of Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saints, a former Protestant Christian. I read all the anti-Mormon information and found that the Mormon apologist gave a more compelling argument which gave me enough room to have faith and pray to God about the Book of Mormon. You say, I think Hans Matson and others in the church are not the only people going through faith crises. I went to, when I went to the various Protestant churches when I was younger, I never heard them discussing issues of forgery in the Bible, absence of early manuscripts, the historicity of important biblical characters like Moses and Abraham. These problems, as you know, Justin, are not exclusive to Mormonism. 
Okay. And uh, Solomon in Arkansas says, um, I imagine this reaction is one you'll get a couple of times. I'm a bit disappointed with Russ, the former Mormon. He had extreme difficulty staying on topic and hardly seemed to be able to address it in any meaningful way. Um, I fear a great number of your recurring guests would have been far better. Uh, James White spent years on Mormonism before he developed his current focus. And uh, finally, um, Tony says, I'm just beginning the Mormon show. Want to say I'm surprised at the supposed crisis they're facing because it seems like Mormons are everywhere in the San Francisco area, which is presumably where you live, Tony. Maybe that's just because I know a lot of rock climbers. I I didn't get that, Tony. I have to confess, are are Mormons more likely to be rock climbers? If only you can explain Tony's interesting reference to rock climbing in relation to that program i'd be interested to hear you also wanted to email about the abortion debate of the week before uh, saying the topic has never stirred me up so much i think because my wife is at 18 weeks but both speakers and this was you may remember a public debate that i was playing out on that program did a poor job responding to the audience i was surprised the pro-life dude didn't come back at the woman who equated human value with self-consciousness apparently she doesn't sleep um and uh, others also got in touch on this issue but uh, running out of time I'm afraid to get to those responses maybe we'll do some more um, at another time can't do them next week because we're not having any feedback time on next week's show that's because I'm giving the whole show over to next week's debate you're unbelievable yes it's a bit of a corker that's the reason we felt we needed the whole of the show time to be able to get to the issues at stake I'm going to be joined by Stephen Mayer who's one of the leading intelligent design proponents in the world. His new book, Darwin's Doubt, claims that what's called the Cambrian Explosion, where many new life forms seem to have appeared in the geological record all at one time, suggests the activity of intelligent design, of a designing agent. Well, uh, opposite him is going to be atheist biologist Charles Marshall, who's written a response to the book, in a science journal. Uh, They're going to be having a fascinating conversation, so you want to come back for that same time, same place next week. For the moment, thank you for listening to Unbelievable Today, and do keep listening if you're here on Premier Radio. I'm going to be joined by the former Archbishop of Canterbury, Rowan Williams. (laughs) 